every new Christian need to know? Let's say that uh, someone in your life, a loved one, a family member, a friend, you've recently had the opportunity to uh, help them make a commitment to follow Jesus Christ, and now you really want to help them get a good start in terms of living the Christian life and growing in their faith, what would be of primary importance for you to tell them as they embark on the rest of their life, this journey, their spiritual journey they're on? Well, the New Testament missionaries, Paul and Barnabas, they were, they were really in this very situation in Acts chapter 14. They were on their first missionary journey, and they had, shed, they, they had shared the gospel with people in various towns. They had led them to the Lord, and then they went on to other towns to minister. And at a certain point in their missionary journey, they decided it would be wise for them to retrace their steps and go back to the towns that they had already visited so that they could establish and encourage the new Christians that there were there. We read in verse 21 of Acts 14, Then Paul and Barnabas returned to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, that's in eastern Turkey, not in central, north central uh, Lake County, uh, but that's probably where the name came from. And, And as they went back to these towns, they strengthened the disciples and encouraged them to remain true in the faith. Now, we know that many things need to be said to strengthen and encourage beginners in the faith so that they will remain true to the faith. So Paul and Barnabas must have said a lot of things to these baby Christians, to these new disciples. But notice verse 22. Of all the things that these ministry partners probably shared with the new converts, Luke, the author of Acts, reports only one. Evidently, Paul and Barnabas said of an utmost importance, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Evidently, of all the things that every new Christian needs to know, one of the most important things is that hardships are normal. In fact, Paul says many hardships are the norm. And so early on in their spiritual journey, Christ's followers must recognize that Jesus isn't going to lead them down easy street. No, along the road to heaven, the Bible says we're going to encounter multiple difficulties, so we shouldn't be surprised whenever adversity shows up in our lives. Do you find it hard at times to be a dedicated and genuine Christian? I hope so, because if you think that following Jesus is easy, I'm worried about you. If you have committed your life to Christ, then, then, then thinking that his job is to shield you from hardships and to make your life comfortable, well, if that's what you think, you've got it wrong. On the other hand, if you understand that tough times are to be expected at every turn as you walk the life steps of Jesus, well, then you have embraced the normal Christian life. For when we sign up to follow Jesus, going through many hardships is an unavoidable part of the deal. Are you facing some difficulties in your life right now? Well, isn't it nice to know that you're normal? Isn't it nice to know that your life is normal as a Christian? Well, since hardships are normal, we'd better learn how to handle hardships. And so this morning, to make sure we're equipped for the rugged journey that that we're on, to make sure that we are prepared for the inevitable bumps and potholes on the road as we travel toward our heavenly destination, we're going to examine in the Bible some important travel tips. And the first travel tip reinforces our study from last week, if you were here, about trying to make sense of the bad things that happen in our lives and trying to make sense of the tragedies that happen in the world. And we said last week that the Bible makes it very clear that we've got to trust God's wisdom and his goodness. Back when my daughters were uh, younger, it has been back in the 1990s, there was a movie that came out that became one of the favorites of theirs. It was called The Preacher's Wife. And in it, an angel is sent from God down here to earth to uh, help a struggling inner city church. And this angel takes on human form. His name is Dudley, played by actor Denzel Washington. And Dudley begins to get involved in the lives of the people in the church and in the community. And experiencing this new experience of an angel being a human being, his heart starts to bond with people all around him. One day he's standing in the pastor's uh, living room, and he looks out the window, and he sees a little boy that he's come to know in the community, a little boy that he really likes, a little boy that's had a troubled childhood, no parents, and been staying in various homes. And he watches as this boy is carted out of the house, screaming and crying, not wanting to leave this new home that he's been in, but he likes the people so well, and yet he needs to move on to another foster care place. 
and in anguish, Dudley watches as this boy, against his will and again in great pain, is pushed into the car and taken off to yet another place. And Dudley pauses for a moment, and you see a tear begin to form on his cheek, and it comes down, and he looks up to heaven, to the God that he serves as an angel in heaven. And he says, I know you have a master plan, but sometimes you're a little hard to figure. And I think if we're all honest, there are times when we all feel like that. We don't know why God does what he does. We don't know why God allows what he allows. But yet the Bible says we need to be remaining steady in our conviction that even when we don't have God figured out, we need to understand that he has a master plan and that he's the only one qualified to run this universe and that he never makes a mistake. God gently reminds us in the Bible that there's a huge gap between his capabilities and ours. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. God says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways and thoughts higher than yours. The Bible teaches that there's no way that we could fully understand or appreciate what God is up to in our lives or in our world. Our puny minds cannot track with God. We simply must trust that the decisions of God are always good and right and wise. A few years ago, I had a grandson named John that died when he was eight days old. He had been born three months premature. He came into the world at one pound, 12 ounces, had a lot of lung and heart difficulties, and and he passed away literally as I was holding him in my arms in the ICU as we were saying goodbye to him. Lots of why questions flooded into my mind as a grandpa. Lots of why questions were among our family members. And we were comforted in those days especially by a verse that was pointed out to us from Psalm 1830, a verse that helped us to regain perspective. And that verse says this, As for God, his ways are perfect. Now, I can't begin to understand for sure why God's plan was it was, was it was, the way it was for my grandson, but I do understand. And in fact, we still have a plaque this day in our house that has on, that, uh, in, uh, on it that verse, as for God, his way is perfect. We long for answers to our why questions, don't we? But there's another why question I, I want us to consider today. Why do humans ask Why? Why do we humans experience frustration and anguish and impatience over the evil and the suffering that is in the world? Our questions and our confusion stem from the fact that we, we, we humans have a built-in longing. We long to see the big picture, but we're presently unable to take it all in. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. He, God, has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. We humans have eternity planted in our heart. Here on Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, it's a good day for us to remind ourselves what sets human life apart from all other life, what makes it sanctified or sacred. It's that God has planted his image on our hearts, including eternity. And we ask why questions as human beings because eternity is planted in there. We have an innate desire to live forever and to understand the grand design and purpose of everything. And that is what sets us apart from animals. Your pet dog or cat or your pet parakeet or tropical fish are not wondering or fretting about the devastation of Hurricane Sandy. They don't have any questions about the incomprehensible evil of the Sandy Hook school shooting. Animals don't ask questions or think about the meaning and the fragileness of life. Animals don't worry about the prospect of death, even though... They are going to die, and they don't know it. Animals don't have eternity planted in their heart. But we do, and that's why we instinctively know that something's terribly wrong with our world. We get it as human beings that this present messed up world is not the way it's supposed to be, that it's not the place that we belong. We all have this restless yearning within us as human beings in our hearts to live forever in a perfect world. That's the eternity thing that's planted in our heart. We want a place where there are no hurricanes or school shootings, a place where little kids aren't tossed from one foster home to another. Because eternity has been planted in your heart by your maker, this life and this world, it's too confining for you, isn't it? 
You're built for eternity. You long for your life to stretch beyond the boundaries of your brief stay in this imperfect world. You sense that you were made for something bigger and better than just this life here and now, and that's because God has planted eternity in your heart. You have eternal aspirations, and so you know down deep that there is more to life than just living and dying. And that's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful gift from God. But the second half of this verse in Ecclesiastes poignantly describes the challenge that we have as human beings living in a fallen world with eternity planted in our heart. It says here that you and I cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. We want to comprehend everything. We want to see the big picture. We want to have all the puzzle pieces and see how they fit perfectly together to give us the big picture, but we can't. We can't see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end because we're standing too close to this great tapestry of God's beautiful masterpiece. We're attempting to take it all in. But its grand design, its overall design escapes us as human beings because we're limited, we're earthbound, we're mortal human beings, and we can't get back far enough to view life from God's perspective and see the world as God sees it. And that's why for now, we simply got to trust God's wisdom and his goodness until that day comes when our perspective is broadened and our eternal aspirations are filled through our faith in Jesus Christ. Meanwhile, we must let God be God. It's not always easy, but we just got to remind ourselves that there is a God and we're not Him. There are times when I struggle emotionally with the hardships I experience in my life or in my ministry when I see what's happening in the world. And here's a trio of quotes that have helped me resist the tendency to get frustrated or angry or anguished or impatient when I don't understand and when I can't see God's plan. Thomas Watson, an old godly Puritan in the early history of America, reminds us that logic and analysis can only get us so far. We can't figure God out. We can't figure things out. There will always be a realm of mystery in life because God's ways are higher and deeper than mine and yours. So Watson says, where reason cannot wade, their faith must swim. I like that picture. Amid life's life's hardships, we can wade for a while as we try to figure out God, but when the waters of God's plan and providence get too deep for us and we're no longer touching bottom, it's there that our faith simply needs to begin to swim. Contemporary Christian writer Philip Yancey offers this profound definition of the kind of faith in God that swims far and long. He says, faith is believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. We can't figure things out right now. They don't make sense. But if we know Jesus Christ, someday we will be in heaven and we will be able to look back in reverse and see things from God's perspective and they will make sense to us like never before. I've told you before about a stitchery, uh, an embroidered piece that my mom used to have hanging in our dining room back home. It was a beautiful landscape, very pretty. I happened to be walking through the dining room one day as a boy when I saw her take it down off the wall. She was cleaning things and she was dusting off the picture, and I saw the back of the, the stitchery. Now, I'm told by people who do this well that the back and the front really won't look that different if you know what you're doing. But uh, mom had gotten this from a gift from somebody that probably was a first-time embroiderer or something because on the back of it, man, there were all sorts of knots and strings going every direction. It was gnarly. And, And you looked at it, you really couldn't tell for sure exactly what it was supposed to be until you turned it around and looked at the picture, and it was beautiful. And I've often had to think about the fact that right now, as we look at life, as we look at this world, we're seeing the backside of the picture. And from our perspective, it doesn't have any rhyme or reason. It looks like this doesn't go there, and why is that there, and so forth. But if someday we're able to get on the other side in heaven and look back at life in this world, we'll see the beautiful picture of God's master design. Faith is believing right now in advance what will only make sense when we're looking in reverse. Oz Guinness neatly sums up why it makes sense to trust God when things don't make sense. He says, we don't know why, but we know why we trust God who knows why. We're convinced that there must be good and perfect reasons for all the bad things that happen because our God is good and perfect. We simply trust what God does now, even though we can't figure it out, because we know who he is. In the Nazi Blitz on London during World War II, there were two British pastors who were walking home weary after a long day and night of comforting people who had been bombarded by the war. 
One pastor, in a moment of transparent frustration, just bared his soul to his friend by saying, oh, I wish I was on God's throne for 10 minutes. The implication being, boy, if I was in charge, you would see some of the changes I would make in this world. And the other pastor, sensing where he was going with that, interrupted him and lovingly rebuked his friend by saying, if you were on God's throne for 10 minutes, I wouldn't want to live in your world for 10 seconds. Something we need to hear sometime because none of us are qualified to do God's job. And that's why we must trust God. We don't know why things happen, but we know why we trust the one. Who knows why? And that's enough for now. At this point, I'd like to backtrack to the verse that we opened with today, the one that tells us that hardships are normal, because I want to point out something to you there. It's significant here that the Bible doesn't say that we will go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. That's true enough. We will, but the Bible actually says we must. Isn't that interesting? We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. In other words, God's Word doesn't just merely predict that bad things will happen to us. It tells us that according to God's plan, bad things must happen to us. They're not optional. They're necessary if we are going to make progress on our spiritual journey. There will be no gain in our lives if there is no pain in our lives. All throughout the Bible, God makes clear that hardships will be many and that they are necessary because they are designed and God wants us to grow through what we go through. The same Apostle Paul who told those new disciples that we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God also wrote in the book of Romans, chapter 5, that hardships are capable of triggering a much-needed chain reaction in our lives. See if you can see the chain reaction as I read these verses. We can rejoice, Paul writes, when we run into problems and trials, for we know, what do we know as Christians? That these trials and problems will help us develop endurance. And what does endurance do? It develops strength of character, And then what does character do? As our character grows stronger, it strengthens our hope of salvation. See the chain reaction there? We go through bad times because God uses them to develop first endurance and then character and then hope. And God is doing all of this so that we are gradually molded to become more like Jesus Christ. Why is that important? Because someday we're going to live in heaven Believers in Christ, forever with Christ and like Christ, and God wants to do all he can right now to get us ready for that day of perfection, that eternity of perfection. He wants to reduce the culture shock that we're going to experience when we get to heaven. And so he is helping us to grow more and more now like we will be perfectly in heaven so that we when we get there, it won't be so jarring. And that's God's made purpose for your life right now. Once you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's not to keep you comfortable. It's to conform you more to the image of Jesus Christ so the culture shock will be less when you get to heaven. And the Bible tells us that's why we rejoice in our sufferings. The Bible doesn't say we rejoice because of our sufferings. No Christian is a masochist. No Christian says, oh, I love these problems. I love these trials. These are so enjoyable. Bring them on, God, because this is so much fun. We don't say that. What we say is, God, thank you that in the midst of the problems and the trials, I can find reasons to be thankful because I can see how you are causing me to grow through what I'm going through. And these things don't feel good, but I know that they are good for me as you are producing in your life what you want me to be during these hard times. The bottom line then is that when hardships arrive, that we need to move beyond the question that naturally wells up within us uh, uh, at those points to the second question, the more important question, if we're going to grow through what we go through. See, when hardship arrives in my life, there is one question that instinctively and immediately comes to my mind. How can I get out of this? That's what you think too. And that's not necessarily bad. This is a normal thing for us as human beings. In fact, when Christians get sick, when a Christian here at Village Church is diagnosed with cancer, we pray for healing. We encourage that person to go find the best doctors they can find. It's our natural desire to want to get out of what we're going through. And when we have cancer, we want to get out of it by getting over it, if possible, as soon as we can. But the Bible tells us that when we ask the question, how can I get out of this? That shouldn't be the only question we ask. That we should follow that up by asking another question. And we really know we're starting to mature in the Christian faith when we move beyond the how can I get out of this to the second question, what can I get out of this? What does God want me to learn from this hardship? He has it there for a reason. 
And through this difficulty, what does God want to do in my life to make me more like Jesus and to prepare me for heaven and to prepare me for me to be a representative of him here in this life? I heard a Christian testify on Moody Radio as I was driving my car this week. He was talking about his bout with cancer, and he said the cancer has been his best teacher on earth that he's ever had in his life. Isn't that a good perspective to have? God brings hardships into our lives that can serve as teachers, instructing us on how to grow through what we go through. And it may be God's will at times, for instance, to heal the disease that we have, to bring him glory, but sometimes he decides to wait until we get to heaven to bring physical healing to our bodies because of what he intends to do here and now in our life and perhaps in the lives of others through the hardship and the suffering. That brings God glory too. So when hardships arrive in your life, don't just ask that first instinctive question, how can I get out of this? But ask the second question, what can I get out of this? Because often God's immediate plan is not for us to escape suffering, but to employ it, to ask him, how can I put this to good use in my life? In fact, when mature Christians encounter hardships, they don't exclaim with a defeatist attitude, what's the use? What's the use of being a Christian? What's the use of trying to follow Jesus? All that gets me is these problems. What's the use? No, use those same words, but ask it a little bit differently. Not what's the use, but what's the use? God, what's the use for this? Have a teachable attitude that says, what can you do in my life? What do you want to do, God, to use this hardship? How should I employ it in my life to build my faith, my character, my ministry, and my witness? Not, oh, what's the use? But what's the use? Our God is versatile and creative and has several ways that he can use the hardships that we face. First, God uses our hardships for our own benefit. We've been talking about that. The Apostle Paul had lots of experiences with hardships in his life and ministry. He speaks of, uh, personally of a couple of these hardships in his second letter to the Corinthian church. First in chapter 1, he writes, we were under great pressure. He's talking about his experience. We were under great pressure. Interesting word choice, pressure. It means pressed in, hard pressed on every side. It, it means squashed. It means crushed. Do you ever feel like that as a Christian? Paul did. Life was squeezing on in him from the north and the south and the east and the west, and no matter which way he turned, he was under tremendous pressure. If you feel that way at times, welcome to the normal Christian life. Of course, you would prefer relief from the pressure, but maybe God has you right where he wants you. Maybe the pressure is good for you, and instead of relief from the pressure, God may, j may well just want to give you the resilience you need not to cave under the pressure. Back to the text. Paul says, we were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. Let's pause again. Notice that the hardship that Paul faced was too much for him. It was more than he could handle. In fact, he says it was far beyond his ability to endure. Now, it's common in Christian circles. I've heard it for a number of years. In fact, I used to say it. Uh, we, we, we say as Christians, God will never give us more than we can handle. And I've come to realize, particularly from this verse, that that's really not a biblical statement. It's really not true to say that God will never give you more than you can handle. He gave Paul more than he could handle, something that was beyond his ability to endure. The truth is not that God will never give you more than you can handle. The truth is God will never give you more than he can handle. There's a big difference. Back to the text. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. But this happened, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. There it is. God uses hardship in our lives to get us to rely on his ability instead of our own. When the hardships get too heavy for us to carry, God may at times choose to lighten our load, and we love it when he does that. But sometimes God says to us, I'm not going to lighten the load. But how about I, if I give you my strength? How about if I strengthen your shoulders and your back so that you can carry the load in my strength and then I can do some things in your life that I want to do? You see, God is always wanting to help us learn to depend on him. And later in the same letter, Paul describes a time when God gave him what he calls a thorn in the flesh. And Bible scholars have concluded that this most likely is something that Paul is referring to here uh, as to a physical malady in his mind, my, his life, some disease or debilitation, some bodily affliction that made life and ministry more difficult for him. And the pain and the discomfort and the inconvenience of it, well, Paul says it tormented him. 
Paul says, I have this physical ailment in life, and it's tormenting me. And notice that he prayed more than once for relief from this thorn in the flesh. Paul's first instinct, like ours, is how can I get out of this? He wanted to escape the suffering, so he prayed for healing. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, the Bible invites us to do that. He asked God, indeed, Paul says, he pleaded with the Lord to take this physical malady away. Now, I find it interesting, however, that Paul prayed for healing three times, not 300 times. Because the Lord spoke to Paul and made him realize that it's always, not always God's will to heal our bodies in this life. And rather God, rather, God promised to give Paul the grace to endure it instead of taking the illness away. That would be enough, God says. And with God's sufficient and sustaining grace, Paul learned that God's power is most clearly manifested in our weakness. When we are weak, we learn to rely more on God's strength, and then the Bible says that's when we're truly strong. What a paradox. It's when we're weak and we realize our weaknesses, and we admit our weaknesses, that we then can truly become strong because we begin to rely on God's strength rather than our own. So the best question to ask the Lord when hardships arrive is, what's the use? And the best prayer to pray is, Lord, help me not to waste this suffering that you've given to me, but to benefit from it. Now, God not only wants to use our hardships for our own benefit, he wants to use them to benefit others too. For this biblical truth, we can stay right here in 2 Corinthians. Paul opens the letter this way. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all of our troubles. Why? So that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. See, one of the reasons God has us go through the many hardships is not only so that we can grow through them, but also so that we can become more caring toward other people who are hurting. He provides us his comfort in the midst of our pain so that we can enter sympathetically into the painful experience of others and bend God's comfort toward them. What do I mean by that? In other words, God, when you're going through tough times, delights to give you his comfort and strength And then not just to use it all up ourselves, but to take that comfort that he's given us and bend it 90 degrees so that we can in turn share it or pass it along, pay it forward to other people, to give to them the comfort that we ourselves have received from God. In other words, God loves to turn our pains and our weaknesses and even our failures into a powerful ministry that helps others grow and helps draw them to God. God never wastes a hurt. In fact, your greatest ministry will most likely come out of your greatest hurt. Who could better help the parents of a Down syndrome child than other parents of a Down syndrome child? Who could better comfort a wife whose husband has left her and for an affair than a woman who went through that same agony herself? Who could better help somebody recover from the pain of a miscarriage or a divorce or a business failure or the death of a loved one than someone who has already been through the same thing. The Bible teaches that God intentionally allows you and me to go through painful experiences in order to equip equip us for ministry to others. We don't want to waste our suffering. We want to turn it into a ministry. We want to turn it into a witness. And when God, when people see God using you in spite of your weaknesses and your pain, it not only helps them grow stronger, but perhaps it even encourages them to think, hey, maybe God can use me too in pain and weak as I am. But it's not just the bad things that happen to us that become opportunities for ministry. God can even use the bad things we do, our sinful failures and our shortcomings for his glory and for the good of others. You see, it is often the things that you're most embarrassed about, most ashamed about, and the most reluctant to share that become the very tools that God can powerfully use to heal and to touch others. It may well be that the one experience in your life that you most resent or you regret the most, or the one failure or hurt in your life that you prefer to hide or forget, it may be the very experience God wants to turn into your personal ministry so that you can comfort others with the comfort you have received from God. And I think one of the most effective tools in evangelism is our common ground with unbelievers in the painful life experiences that all humans share. Why does God allow Christians to get cancer? Well, among other things, one of the reasons is so that lost people who are battling cancer without hope in Christ can see the difference that Jesus makes. 
For the same reason, God allows Christ followers to experience the untimely or tragic death of a loved one because spiritually lost people need to see the difference Jesus and the confidence of eternal life that we have can make in how, and the difference can make in how we as Christians grieve. And Christians go through unemployment, provides an opportunity to show lost people who are watching us more than we realize how to trust God to provide for our needs. And it can be something that will draw them to God. God gives comfort in all kinds of troubles so that he can help us pass his special kind of comfort to others. And the greatest thing about being a Christ follower is knowing that no matter what hardships God asks us to handle, no matter how much pain and suffering God expects us to endure, it will be worth it all in the end. The eternal gain will be more than compensating for the temporary pain. These words startle me whenever I read them in Romans 8. Yet what we suffer now as Christians in this life is nothing compared to the glory that he will reveal to, reveal to us later. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Paul is saying that when we look back on our hard times someday when we get to heaven, if we are believers in Jesus Christ and we see all the tough times we went through, in light of all that we'll be experiencing up there in heaven, the good things that are in store for us forevermore, we'll look back on this life, and no matter how much pain and suffering we've had, we'll say, <laughs> that was really nothing. Heaven's joys will overwhelm and obliterate earth's sorrows. Oh, it doesn't seem like that now. When we're presently going through the hardships in this world, they seem really long and they seem to last too long. But the Bible reminds us that it's a matter of perspective. And when we adopt a long-range eternal viewpoint, all the sufferings of our entire time on earth, when we get to heaven looking back, are going to seem brief and trivial. That's the point of 1 Peter 5.10. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory after you have suffered a little while. Isn't that interesting how God basically sums up all the suffering and pain that we experience in our life, no matter how long he lives, and he calls it, oh, that's just suffering a little while. And after we've done that, he'll restore us and make us strong and firm and steadfast forever. That's God's perspective. In light of eternal glory that he is waiting for us, any suffering we undergo down here on earth amounts to only a little or only a little while. I think I've mentioned before that in the last five years, uh, two times my wife and experienced my wife and I have experienced two really unpleasant experiences in hotels a few years back we were staying in a hotel in Ohio it was a cold January day much like this we needed to get up early and get to somewhere where we were going got into the shower and it was completely cold completely cold found out later that the hotel's water heater had broken in that area of the hotel oh I can't described to you the unimaginable suffering that I experienced that morning. <laughs> Forced to take that cold shower. And then just a few years after that, we were in another ho hotel. We were sleeping. It was about 2 o'clock in the morning, and a fire alarm goes off. This loud, blaring fire alarm out in the hallway just woke us up with a start. And we, we called the hotel desk, and they said, get out. Everybody get out immediately. And, and, and so we got up. It was another January or February day. It was cold and dark. We went outside. We're standing outside, huddled and shivering and watching the firemen as they checked to make sure the hotel is all right. So it turned out it was a false alarm. The firemen were doing their job, a good job. Finally, they released us to go back into the hotel, and we go back in, and we get back into bed, and I couldn't sleep at all. I couldn't sleep at all any more than I. All the terrible suffering that I experienced in those hotel tragedies. And you say to me, Pastor Todd, if that's the worst suffering you've ever had to endure, it's really no big deal. And you're right. But now take a look at this observation by a devout Christian woman a few centuries ago, St. Teresa, not Mother Teresa of this uh, time, but St. Teresa. Look what she said. In light of heaven, the worst suffering on earth will seem to be no more serious than one night in an inconvenient hotel. See, there will come a day when we are enjoying the perfection of heaven, if we know Christ, with each glorious day being even better than the perfect one before it, and then we will look back at our little while down here, and we will say all the pain and suffering and hardship that we experienced in this life was no big deal. Eh, it was kind of like a cold shower or a sleepless night in a hotel. In other words, no matter how hard life gets here right now for us as Christians, it will be worth it all when we get to heaven. There's an old chorus. We're not going to sing it now, but it's an old chorus. Let me just give you the words to it. 
goes like this. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face and all sorrows will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. That's how Christians handle hardship. Would you stand with me as I close in prayer? God, I thank you for the hope that we have through Jesus Christ that someday, looking back, we will see the trials and the suffering and the problems of this life as if they were nothing compared to all the good things we will enjoy in heaven. But meanwhile, Lord, right now, down here, we need to learn how to handle the hardships. And I pray more and more that you will give the people of Village Church that eternal perspective. And I pray more and more you would give us as a people the ability to grow through what we go through. Lord, I pray that you will help us as we go through tough times to say, not just how can I get out of this, but what can I get out of this? And Lord, would you do a work in our lives to make us more and more like Jesus Christ to your honor and glory. And God, help us not to waste anything that comes into our lives. At tough times, help us to turn them into a ministry to other people. And Lord, I pray that you will help us to be faithful all throughout our lives till we see Christ. God, there may be people here today that are still seeking and searching for that meaning and purpose in life. And I pray that if there's anyone here that doesn't know Jesus, the one who came to solve this problem of evil, that they will give their lives over to Jesus today so that they too can experience this wonderful perspective and this wonderful hope. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen and amen. God bless you as you go.